So I am a quantitative macroeconomist. So the way that, I came to, that we came to write about this paper was that Steven Derloff, who was one of the organizers but was also not able to make it, right, um, he took a notice of um, some of the research I was doing with Anand, and this was mainly about intergenerational human capital investments. Right? And he thought it would be a good idea to kind of simulate how the degrees of equality of opportunity would change in our quantitative model um, in response to um, counterfactual economic policies. Okay. So we proceeded to do just that. In the process of doing so, the problem was that we didn't really know much about the distributive justice literature at that point. Um, so we've been doing a lot of research in the past few months. and. Um, I still can't claim that I have a very deep understanding of the literature, right? but as far as I could tell, um, it seems like um, our dynamic macro models does have something to say that it didn't seem like um, uh, the literature was giving too much attention to. Right? So I'm going to try to highlight that in the presentation. Okay? So why do we want to do this? Like I said, we, we're basically just going to operationalize some abstract concepts into a very specific model. Right? And the reason for economists to do that is because, um, as many people have already noted, um, the state of the art is, in economics, is kind of just applying this utilitarian concept of social welfare. And I would say that it's probably even worse in um, macroeconomics in the sense that we really don't care about anything else, as far as I know. And, I, and I'm, um, um, I'm also one of the, um, the criminals. <laughs> okay. But so we tried to apply some uh, measures of um, EOP. So I'm going to just refer to equality of opportunity as EOP in our model. And uh, one thing that I want to kind of point out is that some policies that kind of seem to deliver a large increase in equality of outcomes may not necessarily have such an impact on equality of opportunities. Okay. So like I said, we're going to do this in an intergenerational framework. And kind of the difference in our model um, compared to a lot of other models that have kind of thought about equality of opportunity is that we're going to have an infinitely, dynast uh, infinitely lived dynastic framework. Right? So this, kind of, this framework kind of um, sheds light on some things that uh, I think did not re receive much attention. And namely, the, I'm going to argue that the outcome variables of the child, so basically the object that you look at for measuring um, equality of opportunity, should be chosen differently according to which parental background variable <coughs> that you want to compensate for. Right? So kind of the idea is that uh, many people have been talking about this already yesterday, that if, you, if some child is better off just because of some um, high value of a variable in the, uh, for a parental background, it seems like it should be compensated for. And I'm going to argue that, well, the back background outcome variable pair that you choose should be different. Okay? And this is only going to, well, it, you could think about it in a two-generation framework, but it's much more obvious in an infinitely lived dynastic framework. Okay? So how are we going to do this? First, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to, I'm not going to go through too much of the details of the model. It's going to be um, kind of tedious for this crowd. So I'm going to just kind of briefly explain the model and then kind of uh, show you that we can, it's very easy to map the state space and choices of a recursive decision problem into parental background variables and child outcome variables. And once I have that, right, so that's the two objects that I'm going to use to measure EOP. Right, first, I'm going to try to just apply something that has already appeared in the empirical economics literature. I'm going to use an ordinal measure of EOP, and this is basically nothing more than just looking at the conditional distributions of the child outcome variables um, conditioned on the parental background variables. Right? So unfortunately, this is not going to take us so far because our model is very stylized. Right? So it kind of works well in an empirical framework, not so much in, a, in, a stylized, in the context of stylized model. So then I'm going to also look at um, the Thale index of these outcomes. Right, so why do I want to look at a Thale index? Well, well, what these guys are doing are, look, are looking at the conditional distributions, right, conditional on the parental background variable. So the kind of attractiveness of a Thale index is that I can kind of do the same thing in a cardinal way. I can just look at the Thale index of the outcomes and split them into groups by the parental backgrounds. Okay. And I'm going to compare this with um, the things that macroeconomists usually like to look at, like uh, the intergenerational elasticity of earnings or Gini coefficients of earnings and wealth. So I'm just going to uh, briefly describe the model. So the model is very standard in the sense that it's kind of following the tradition of Becker and Thomas, right? So you just have a parent who wants to invest in the child, but the parent can invest in the child in two ways. He can invest in his human capital, but also leaves financial bequests, okay? And I'm going to, in our previous paper, or a series of papers, we showed that uh, what really matters in this kind of framework is, are the childhood investments. And it also matters, especially if you, if you want to explain the data, to account for parental time and not just goods inputs, okay? 
Now, of course, we don't want to just let human capital explain everything, right? That would be a little bit unfair when you try to explain the data. So there's going to be also be uh, exogenous. So we're also going to assume an exogenous transmission of genetics. Right? So this is just simply saying that if you have a naturally smart parent, right, so naturally smart parents are going to have um, naturally smart kids, right? But even if you have a dumb kid, you can still invest a lot in human capital, and you can overcome for this dumbness. Okay? And kind of um, what I mean. So uh, Becker had a series of papers about intergenerational invest investments, right? But then, kind of what um, was empir empirically lacking was that uh, the Becker model would deliver some predictions about what should happen between families who do leave bequests and don't leave bequests. Right? So basically, if you have a bequest constraint in a very simple model, what's going to happen is that as long as the returns to financial investments are linear and the investments to human capital are concave, you're just going to invest up to the amount that um, the marginal returns to human capital investments is equal to the linear um, returns in the financial investment, and then the rest are just going to leave bequests. Right? So this is kind of the mechanism in the becker tones model. Um, so what's going to happen here is that if you're a poor parent, you're not going to be able to efficiently invest in your child. Right? The problem was that this didn't really, uh, people had a hard, hard time uh, trying to bear this out in the data. Right? So we, what we did in a previous paper was that if you combine a becker tomes kind of model and kind of add a multi-period life cycle structure into it, right, you, it does a much better job at um, explaining the data. And the main reason is because it just splits the timing of investment in children. Right? So in the becker tomes model, a parent just makes a once and for all decision. He, uh, he simultaneously makes decisions about how much to invest in human capital and also in physical capital. Right? But then um, once you split, once you have a life cycle structure, right, you invest early on in the child's human capital when I'm a young parent, right? but you only leave financial bequests when you're an old parent and about to die. Right? And this helps explain um, a lot of features of the data, but that was, a, that was the previous paper. Right? So the reason I'm um, putting this up here is that right, um, the model Although it's a stylized model, it's not so bad in capturing um, empirical relationships, in, par in particular of inequality and intergenerational mobility in the US, right? because that's what's kind of important for analyzing equal um, equality of opportunities. And also, kind of the same things that allowed us to explain the data are going to bear out in our measures of, um, equality of EOP. So like I said, for this crowd, I think what's most relevant is that there's some things that we have to think about when you, when you think about more than two generations, right? So if you're in a static framework with just a parent and a child, um, there's, you're kind of ignoring what happens with the, grand, the grandparents or the grandchild, right? And this kind of bears out in our model very nicely because it's stylized. So just to kind of make my point, suppose you want to look at the child earnings at the outcome variable, right? This is a very standard approach, I think. Right. Then I'm going to argue that what you should, what, that what should be compensated for is not the earnings of the parent. Right? And this is maybe very, a little bit uh, not, not very palatable, but um, just bear with me for a second. Right? It's because, when, because the parent himself is making a lot of investments in the child. Right? If, you don't compensate, if you don't reward the child for this, you're basically ignoring the efforts that the parent put into the child. And it's not just the parental efforts, right? because the, the, the level of the parent's earnings itself is also an outcome of the efforts of previous generations. So if you, so if you don't reward the child, you're basically ignoring, ignoring rewarding the efforts of all the previous generations. Right? So of course, like I just said, this is not very palatable. And you can also think of it in a way that, well, if you're born into a rich family, of course, maybe the rich family wants to invest a lot into the child, but that itself is just luck that should be compensated for, right? And probably a lot of people would, ag would agree with this notion. Right? So let's say that you still want to keep um, the background variable, parental earnings, uh, as the object that you want to compensate for, but then I'm going to argue that the outcome variable you look at should be different, right? So what you should look at is not the child's earnings, which um, has been done a lot in the literature, but the child's net wealth at a later age, right? It's kind of, it's kind of for the same reason, but uh, in converse. It's because a lot of the child's earnings are also going to be devoted into efforts into future descendants, right? So kind of the argument is that either what you want to do is if you're going to ignore the efforts from all the previous generations, you should also ignore the efforts into all, all uh, future de descendants, right? So what do I get by doing this? So as a benchmark, I'll show you that Suppose I just take the standard um, approach that uh, people do in a two-generational uh, framework and just look at and just kind of group children into um, parental earning quantiles. So I look at um, rich um, children with rich parents and poor parents, and I look at the outcome variable as child earnings. So, so I just see like what the child's earnings looks like. 
uh, depending on um, the, parent, the parental larynx quartile. So compared to that, if you, if you do what I just said, right? So the only thing, if you agree, and I'll, I'll, get, um, I'll explain this more in detail a little bit later, if you agree that previous generations should be rewarded, the only thing that should be compensated for is the parent's gen genetic luck. Okay? So if you look at the conditional distributions of the child's earnings, only conditional on the parent's ge uh, genetic luck, it visually looks like equality of opportunity is almost achieved. So on the other hand, so the, the case that we do want to focus on is probably the second one. Right? So if I, maintain the, if I maintain the viewpoint that I want to compensate for parental earnings, then I just said that we should probably look at child's net wealth, not the child's earnings. Right? In this case, the equality of opportunity uh, looks much worse. Okay? So how do I confirm that this pairing is actually the appropriate pairing that we should be looking at? Well, you, this is really, you can't really do this in the data, of course. But in our model, we can directly look at the continuation utilities of the individual agents. Right? So I'm going to show you later, kind of visually and also with the, with the tail indices, that if you look at the conditional distributions of child's, for example, child's net wealth conditional on parental earnings, it's going to look very similar to what the, continu the, distribution of co uh, the conditional distributions of um, the child's continuation utility is conditional on parental earnings. Right? So this is just kind of uh, giving us a sense of it is kind of delivering the, it is kind of sh showing us the right distribution that we want to look at, right? So insofar as we agree that what you really want to look at is the child's welfare in terms of utilities and not just, um, uh, and not just the economic measures like uh, income or wealth, right? This is kind of confirming that we're looking at the right objects. So obviously, I don't want to push so far that our model is delivering all the complicated aspects of the real world. So we're just kind of raising the point that, well, at least in the stylized models, this is true. So maybe when you even just kind of go directly to the data and want to think about EOP, maybe you should be looking at different kinds of variables. Okay? And related to policy, I'm, going to look, I'm only going to look at um, one specific policy, which is going to be education subsidies. So in the model, education subsidies is just lump sum. It goes to everyone. Right? It just goes into supporting <coughs> the goods investment into the child at an early age. Right? So the reason I chose education subsidies is because uh, in most of these kind of intergenerational human capital investment models, this is what has kind of the largest impact. Right? So I'm going to show you that also in, this, in our model that this has a pretty large impact, um, not just in improving inequality, but also in terms of efficiency. It actually increases um, the lifetime earnings and the utilitarian me measure of welfare by a significant amount. Right? But I'm also going to show you at the same time that it doesn't have so much of an impact on equality of opportunity. So why is this the case? So like I said, the reason is kind of the same reason that we were able, that, we are a, that this kind of model is able to explain the US data. Right? So like I said, the model has childhood investments happening very early on and bequests happening very, very late. Right? And it turns out that if you actually want to explain the data, and when we, try, when we parameterize the model and uh, estimate to the data, it has to be the case that what really matters is not the exogenous transmission of natural abilities, but parental human capital. Right? And the parental human capital, uh, the, the, sorry, the human capital formation process is very nonlinear, and it also has a little bit of a degree of uh, increasing returns. Right? So this is kind of going back to the like Heckman's early childhood literature. Right? So a lot of investment in early childhood has a lot, has a much higher returns um, than you, than you, that it would have if you invested in human capital at a later age. So in our model, human capital is kind of really what matters. And therefore, when I kind of condition the child's earnings um, on the parental abilities, this doesn't really show much of a, a large degree of um, inequality of opportunity. Okay. On the other hand, in our life cycle structure, what matters, the bequest constraints do matter. So we're going to impose a non-negative bequest constraint. So this just basically means that parents early on in their life cycle are not able to borrow against uh, far away ch um, child's earnings that are going to get realized in the future. Right? <coughs> and in our model, what happens is that even though these bequests happen much later in life, it still matters for the young parent at the time that he's making um, investments into the, into the little children. Okay? So because, these, because human capital is very important, and the because co bequest constraints do matter, right? So the poor parents are not going to be able to achieve the efficient level of investment in the children, right? And this 
kind of compounds throughout all the future generations, right? And this, and this makes the degree of, uh, degree of EOP look much worse. So I thought of a lot about how I might relate this to um, what Richard, Richard is going to talk about um, next. So this is something that I just put up yesterday. So again, so we had a little discussion yesterday. I'm not sure still if I fully understood. Right? But one of the arguments that I think um, Richard is going to make is that EOP itself is maybe is not a, vir a virtue in itself. But when you see that EOP is not achieved, maybe it's kind of an indicator of something being wrong. Right? So in our model, right, it's a very stylized model. If we didn't have any frictions, you wouldn't really have any problem with EOP. Right? It's just by assumption. Right? The two frictions that we have is imperfect insurance and the non-negative borrowing constraint, or the bequest constraint. Right? So the imperfect insurance against the sense of luck shock is just that if I'm kind of a young guy and I expect to have some children in the future, but I don't really know if my ch child is going to be as smart or dumber than me, right? but I can't really insure myself in the market against these kind of um, genetic shocks. Right? So this is a missing market in our model. Right? And the bequest constraint is obviously a constraint because we're just blocking parents, um, we're just blocking parents from uh, taking away resources from their children. So the interpretation is that when I look at the EOP and when I condition on parental abilities, it doesn't seem like EOP is so bad. It just means that this imperfect insurance against descendants' luck or genetic ability shocks doesn't seem to be too much of a problem for EOP. But when I condition on um, parental earnings and look at the child's net wealth, and I see that the EOP looks much worse than if I just looked at earnings earnings for both generations, it means that the in inefficient investment in children that comes from the binding borrowing constraint <coughs> is manifested as less EOP that I measure in my model. Right, so I didn't want to actually put up too many equations, so I'm going to I minimize the number of equations I put up here. It's going to be two or three, I think, but I kind of need to put this here to explain the results later. So for th those of you who are not um, maybe familiar with uh, recursive methods, right, this, is, this W of Y is what I'm going to call the continuation value of the of a young parent. Right? And so th this depends on a lot of things, but kind of most importantly, the thing that I put in both script X is what completely characterizes one individual. Right? So this X consists of S, which is the schooling level. So in the model, we have college and high school um, education choices. Um, a is your ability. So this is your ge genetic ability. And what the ability does in our model, it just kind of um, shifts, the, shifts the speed at which you can accumulate human capital. And epsilon is going to be a market luck shock. Right? So this is just something that happens. You start working, and you just happen to be lucky and get a higher earnings or a lower earnings. So this is kind of like the standard idiosyncratic labor shock that you see in a lot of quantitative models. And finally, H is going to the human capital. Right? So this S I just put there for completeness. You don't have to worry too much about this. Right? So what you want to contrast is these, um, this A and epsilon, which is basically kind of capturing luck. Right, so the genetic luck and market luck, and H is the human capital that I want to contrast against um, these kind of luck shocks. Okay. So this is going to be the state of the parent. When I'm a young parent, this is what I have as an individual. How do I make my decisions? It also depends on what my child is going to do, whether or not he's going to go to college, and what his ability is. Right, so at that, at that point that I'm making investments into the child, now I know what the, the, the ability of the child is. Right? And I'm a young parent, so there's an old guy above me who's giving me bequest, right? And that's, gonna, that's this uh, Z subscript Y, okay? So this W function with all these uh, variables are going to completely describe the utility that the young parent gets at any point in time, okay? So I skipped the budget constraint because it's really huge, right? But basically the point is that this long budget constraint is going to include something that we can call um, lifetime earnings, okay? And so I'm just going to call that Z of H, right? So what does this continuation utility consist of? This consists of some period utility. So in one, in one period of time, I get some utility from consumption. And this is just kind of adjusting for the size of the household, because I also have a child. Right? So it's just uh, in case I forgot, it's a one parent, one child kind of model. Right? And everyone has a child. And then I also care about what happens in the future. So this is, this is the value function when I become old. Right? And we'll be on the next slide, so I'm going to skip uh, many detailed explanations on it. How do I form my expectations, though? It's going to depend on the ability of the child, which I know today, but also the market luck shock of my child, which I don't know yet. Right? So this is something that I cannot insure myself against. But also the ability of the grandchild, which I can also not insure myself against. 
So kind of the, actually, even though the, what the, all the action kind of happens in, at the young age, the maybe more interesting value function for purposes of this presentation is, is the old parent's value function. Right? So this is a very stripped down version of um, kind of the other quantitative models that we've been using. So the old parent basically just has a value. It's the same that you have a period utility. Right? It's a very simple value function, but the only choice that he effectively makes is just leave these uh, financial bequests. Okay? And like I said, it's going to be subject to a non-negative V constraint. Okay? So now I know that my child has grown up, and he might be a very rich child, but still I'm, we're going to assume that you cannot just steal the resources from the child and, and there's, because there's, we're only assuming downward altruism. Right? So this theta is, gonna, it's going, is what makes our model infinitely, um, like an infinitely lived di um, dynasty. Right? So as long as I assume that theta is not zero, right, that um, parents do care about children, right, so any kind of ancestor is going to care at a geometrically declining rate about all future descendants. And this is what um, makes a model dynastic. Right? So and I, as I already alluded to, the lack of EOP that I'm going to show you later can be viewed as a manifestation of this constraint. Okay? So <clears throat> just to close the model for, for completion, right? so we also have in the model to make it more realistic, a lot of um, government policies like uh, progressive taxation, um, capital taxation. Um, but most importantly for this talk, we also include education and um, lump sum transfers. Right? So what I'm going to do later is just see what happens when I shift around resources between these two transfers. Okay? So lump sum transfers are basically just try trying to capture um, uh, mean-tested um, transfers for poor households. And this is a standard um, tool in, mac in quantitative macroeconomics. We're going to solve for this model in a stationary equilibrium. If I want to go kind of more hardcore, we can look at transition paths and see how it uh, responds to aggregate shocks like business cycles, but uh, we're not going to do that here. So I'm going to only look at a stationary environment, which you can kind of think of as a very long run outcome of a change in policy. Okay. And I just want to emphasize that even though this model is very stylized, uh, we showed um, in a couple of other different projects that it is empirically convincing, especially compared to s similar models that have appeared in the literature. All right, so this is the more relevant part. Right? So now that I have this model, what I want to do is look at the state space and choices of the individual and basically map it into what I want to call parental background and childhood and child outcomes. Right? Let's first think about the luck shocks. Right? So I told you that there's two luck shocks. There's a genetic shock, which kind of determines how good you are at accumulating human capital, and a market luck shock, which just kind of happens later in life, and you just happen to get a high earnings and low earnings. Right? So this was A and Epsilon. And the way we model it is that A and Epsilon depends on the parent's genetic shock. Right? So if you have a high if you have a high ability parent, it's very likely that, you, that you're going to be a high ability child um, and, vice, uh, and vice versa. So correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding of the um, distributive justice literature was that there are some types of luck that should be compensated and some types of luck that should not be compensated. Okay. And we're going to view everything else in the model, so all the choices that you make conditional on the states, as effort, since we're not actually modeling an effort per se. Right? So all the choices should be compensated for. And we're going to take the stance that all the choices should be compensated for. Right? In terms of the luck, my understanding was that A, which is your kind of genetic ability, should also be rewarded. Right? Because otherwise, you would be violating a self-ownership principle of your own, own God-given natural talent. Right? And we can argue about this, but at least there seems to be some people who will also argue that epsilon should be rewarded in the sense that it's kind of just something that happens later, but in terms of opportunity, they all had the same access to it. Right? So the way that you can think about it is that what you want to compensate for only is apparent to luck, because in the model, mechanically, what we're doing is because this guy because these two guys depend on the, the ability of the parent, right, everyone had the same opportunity to arrive at that point right, if the ability of the parent was the same. Right? So conditional on having the same ability parent, whatever happens by luck afterward should still be rewarded. Right? So I guess this is kind of related to um, luck egalitarianism ideas. And so the way that you can think about it is that um, you go to a casino, Right? And you give people enough money so that everyone has access to the same 
amount of times to uh, run on, uh, to play on the slot machine, right? And some guys are going to be lucky, and some guys are not going to be lucky. And some guys will get rich by the from the slot machine, and some guys won't, right? But that you shouldn't compensate for it because they had the same access to all the slot machines. Okay. So this should still be rewarded up to the point that it's uncorrelated right, with parental <coughs> abilities. Right. Furthermore, like I alluded to in the beginning, everything else in the model, or all the human capital of the parent, is an outcome of efforts from all the previous generations. So if I take this stance, insofar as lifetime earnings is an outcome of your ability or luck shock and your human capital, and like I said in the model, the main determinant is human capital, this should not be compensated for. Right? So if I take the stance, what is my measure of equality of opportunity? The distributions of the child's lifetime earnings conditional only on the parents', the parents and genetic luck should be equal, right? if, if there's full compensation. Okay? Why do I look at the distributions and not just say it should be exactly equal? Because there's also, a lot, uh, so I found that there's some um, literature by uh, the philosophers, in particular by, by Romer, showing that, well, this is kind of practically infeasible. So for EOP, what you want to achieve is just that, that, this, um, that the rewards are relatively um, equal condition on the parental background. Okay? So there will be dispersion given any background group, <coughs> right? but the level of dispersion should be the same across those groups. Okay? Now, like I said, this is not very palatable. Okay? So let's say that, well, we still do want to compensate for parental learning. In the sense, and basically by doing that, we're just ignoring all the ancestral efforts. So like I said, then we should also ignore all the child's efforts that are kind of directed toward his own descendants. Okay. But, so then we shouldn't just look at the lifetime earnings, which was Z of H. We should first take away from the Z of H the amount that you invested in the children. Right? So there's two types of investments. There's human capital investment, which is, I just um, call it investment in children, and the financial bequest. Right? So this variable that I'm going to call um, Z sub W is just basically my net wealth when I'm at a middle age. Right? So this is the ZO that you saw earlier and I forgot to mention. Right? So when I'm a young parent, I make all my decisions. And when I become an old parent, I just carry this um, lifetime wealth. <coughs> but when I die, I also leave some bequests for my child. So that's the Z sub Y. So what you should be looking at is the C sub W, which is just basically the subtraction of these two, right? Because this is free of human capital investment in the children, and this is just capturing the financial transfers you've given to the children, right? So if I take this standpoint, then the measure of equality of opportunity I want to look at is the distribution of these Z sub Ws conditional on um, the parent's lifetime earnings. So I don't want to go too much into detail into this explaining this graph, but I have a long explanation in the paper. Right? So basically what's happening in the model in a graphical way, since I skipped all the equations and how I solve for the equilibrium, is just that let's say that you look at the lifetime earnings of one particular generation. Right? So this is going to be outcome of a lot of things. And what are in here are his own, are, say, let's call this guy the child, the child's own variables. Right? So it depends on um, my own labor market efforts and how much I, and my own labor market efforts, but it also depends on how much I'm going to invest in my children, right? Because there's going to be a trade-off in the sense that I care about my own lifetime earnings, but I also realize I have to invest in my children, so that's going to be kind of, kind of conflict with my own interest of increasing my lifetime earnings. But it doesn't depend on just my states and the things that I do. It also depends on how good my parent was, right? So these are, this schooling level in human capital is what captures that. So kind of in a broad sense, I don't uh, want to explain every single little detail of this graph. What I'm saying is that let's look at the parental lifetime earnings and the child lifetime earnings. There's a direct effect that comes from the parent's efforts. Right? So this is how much the parent actually invests in the child. Right? So I'm going to call this P of E a direct effect. But it's also affected by the exogenous transmission of ability, so how able of a parent did you have. Right? So if, uh, if you have a very able parent, it's going to transmit to affecting the child's um, market luck shock and also the ability shock, which is going to affect the child's lifetime earnings. And basically, the two views that I'm taking is that if I believe that these parental efforts should be compensated for, right, then the only thing that I can really compensate for are things that fall in the parental luck. Okay. 
then there's also the indirect effect, right? So this is a direct effect that comes directly from the parent. The indirect is something that comes from all my ancestors. So by saying that, well, if, if you don't want to only compensate for parental abilities and actually want to cut off this link that comes from all the future, uh, all the previous descendants, that will be basically just cutting off these two uh, thick linkages, right? This P sub B and the P sub B, right? So this is the direct effect from the parent. This is the indirect effect that comes from accumulation of um, previous generations. And for fairness, I think that if you're going to cut, cut this off, you should also cut off what the child does for the grandchild. Right? So this is the efforts that the child is going to put into the grandchild, and this is the accumulated effort that comes from all the previous generations into the grandchild. So either keep these keep all of them or cut all of them. Right? So this is just seems to me um, a log uh, required for logical consistency. So I'll just show you the graphs then, right? So it's because the numbers don't really, don't really matter anyway. Right? So like I said, since I already kind of said all the results, right, I'll just show you. These, these are just the conditional distributions of the Z's W by the earnings and also the lifetime earnings by the ability. Right? So that's what you do if you just uh, look at earnings by earnings. Right? So this is the CDFs of all these distributions. So you can see that this spreads out and this shrinks in. And all I want to say is that it looks kind of similar to the distributions of the consumption equivalent values. Okay. And in, in fact, I can show you with numbers that it's almost exactly the same. Okay. And it's also the same for the Lorentz curves. Okay. So this is just kind of demeaning these distributions and just looking at the conditional distributions. So, so if, I, if I do viability, it seems like even within all the parental background groups, everyone is kind of equally rewarded, while um, if I do it by ZW, it seems to get worse. So for the de since I ran out of time, I won't um, get too much into details, right? So thank you. Um, we have some policy experiments, it's not so, which I was not able to say. It just basically shows you that um, then the equality of outcomes just doesn't equal the equality of opportunity, right? Right, that's it. Sorry for all the time. The equality of opportunity, uh, we're all for it. It's consensual. It's, you know, uh, but it seems to me the first thing is that the consensus is sort of paper thin. I mean, people affirm very different and opposed views under that same name. I think, I think also when you start looking at the different ideals, it's surprisingly difficult to characterize an ideal of equal opportunity that is both reasonably determinate in meaning and plausibly regarded as morally fundamental. That is something we that should, we should go in our set of fundamental moral principles or our moral goal or go into the egalitarian social welfare function or it's the, uh, something we care about for its own sake rather than just as a tool or a means for our ends. Uh, uh, so, the so the diagnosis in the paper is that equal opportunity isn't fundamental, it's of derivative importance. That doesn't mean it's not important, it's just that it's in various notions are going to be tools, not things we care about for their own sake. You may not buy that, but, uh, uh, but at least you know, it seems to me it, it's the, the notion uh, should come across as more problematic and in need of more work. Uh, just one thing I should say by way of clarification. In the paper, I tend to be ecumenical and say I think a br quite broad array of, distri of possible distributive justice views, a broad array of broadly egalitarian views, uh, if that's your, it could be defended. Uh, and in, 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 in any of them, uh, equality of opportunity won't figure as a, as a fundamental element. Won't, won't, it'll, it'll be means, not part of the goal. Uh, but in fact, as, as I, so I'm, I'm ecumenical, but in the paper, my own uh, personal opinions keep creeping through. So I should just come out of the closet and say, just, just you know, this isn't defended in the paper. But at some points in the paper, you, you might think of it as, I'm defending this ecumenical broad range of views of distributed justice against various notions of equal opportunity, but for instance, I take the, my own view and that's something like a kind of welfareist double prioritarianism where welfare, so what matters is good lives for people, fairly distributed. Good lives isn't preference satisfaction, it's not welfareist in the economist sense, it's you know, ob, ob, achieving things that are objectively valuable. That, that's going to, you know, there'll be a, you know, a list and there's a score, there'll be a number, interpersonally cardinal for your uh, achievement, uh, 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 your objectively valuable achievements, and then we can allow partial comparability and so on. Uh, uh, 
and and so that's so that's so we want good lives fairly distributed so we want as much well-being for people as much good lives as possible but uh, we want good lives fairly distributed uh, that mean that means two things it means priority for the worse off uh, putting a thumb on the scale for you know the benefits matter more the worse off the person who gets them and I think priority for the deserving other things equal intrinsically better that saints do better than sinners or at least you know, so your deservingness score also matters for the priority with, of, with which you should get benefits, uh, at least up to hard determinism. You know, with hard determinism, that just drops out. So, if that helps. Uh, so, I skip over, I, the paper talks about four notions, I skip over two. So, let's just start with, with Rawls. Um, so, the idea is, you know, the, the ordinary formal equality of opportunity that we're familiar with, jobs and places in education should be, anybody should be able to apply. and, and uh, uh, the application should be judged on their merits, uh, but people can be unequal, can have no opportunity to qualify. So there's some notion of we, beyond formal equality of opportunity, we want some kind of fair opportunity for people to develop their native talents or for people to become qualified uh, for positions, for competitive positions in society. And it's part of the genius. Uh, of Rawls that he takes this intuitive notion and then sort of pushes it to the limit. And that's the Rawlsian idea of fair equality of opportunity and the idea is essentially th that Rawlsian fair equality of opportunity is achieved when uh, throughout the society anybody with the same native talent and the same ambition for competitive success will have identical prospects of competitive success. Right? So it's you know, it's, uh, it's a simple, uh, powerful idea. I mean, I, I go on to go say na na na, but it's but but, but I mean, I, again, I, I, I attack it, but I, I'm attract. It's it's attractive. It should should be attractive. So it's a certain so the, in a certain idea, this is the ideal of a classless society. Right? You know, it's it's the idea of that it doesn't matter. You can't you can't predict your competitive your prospects in life uh, from just you know am I am I the daughter of a uh, C, a banking uh, CEO magnet, or the daughter of the janitor who works in the bank, or, you know, or the daughter of the homeless vagrant, who, you know, it doesn't matter. My competitive prospects would be the same. You can predict my uh, competitive prospects only from my native ability and my ambition. Right? So it's, it's radical in a certain way. Um, it's, it's just a puzzle, though, is that Theo isn't violated by situations in which two people with the same native talent and different ambition end up with different outcomes. So in some sense, that should be just intuitive, right? You don't want, you know, uh, uh, you know. I suppose I'm just lazy, right? But but it's but in very familiar ways, ambition formation can ha take morally problematic shape. I mean, there are examples in the paper. Just think about men. Suppose we have a world in which men are socialized to be ambitious and strive, be all you can be, and women are socialized to be unambitious. Well, then it wouldn't violate feel if. Uh, uh, you know, two, a man and a woman with the same native talent, but they have different ambitions given the way they're socialized, so they end up with very unequal prospects. Uh, that, that's, that doesn't register as a violation. Uh, you know, there's the, the adaptive preferences, there's lots of preference formation. And, and of course, we do, you know, it isn't just that this happens. I mean, it's part of what we want schools to do is to alter people's ambitions and to, you know, give people, you know, character traits that will, that will and, uh, and you know, virtues, going back to yesterday, that, that will, that will uh, make them better off in life, right? So, so I mean, in the paper, I wrestle with different ways we might revise uh, Theo in order to accommodate this issue in, an, in, an, in a sensitive way. What I end up saying, uh, they, they don't work, and I end up just saying, well, let's just label the problem. Let's say there should be fair quality opportunity in the, in the Rawlsian sense, provided that there's fair socialization, you know? But what's that, you know? Um, you know, uh, I, mean, I, I, you know I, 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 don't, I don't know how to work that out. And when I think, when I think about this, I think, you know, and the, the puzzle is that intuitively some situations in which, you know, suppose for instance that some parents educate their children to be very materialistic and to be looking to be for competitive success, go to Wharton Business School. And some other parents educate their children to be laid back and to be contemplative. And, and, and so they end up with different prospects of competitive success, different ambitions, even if they have this. That seems okay. And in other cases, not. And how do you draw the line? And I think my intuitions are actually welfareist here. So, for instance, take 
uh, this is uh, the example. Suppose we have two individuals, you know, Dick and somebody else. They both have the same ballerina talent and the same ballerina ambition. What I, what I want, you know, um, but they're educated in different ways. So one has, uh, you know, the, the parents go for it. You know, the, the child has, you know, uh, the ballerina uh, or the rock climbing or the, you know, poet uh, ambitions, you know, are trained. So you've got a high prospect of success in that, but, you, but otherwise your, your prospects of competitive success are quite low. The other person isn't trained to be so much specialized to be a ballerina, but is trained in a more broad-based way. So it seems to, I, I can think of cases where roughly your opportunity, even if you're trained in the narrow way, your opportunity for a good life is, is, is fine. Right, so that's okay. It's okay for parents to, even if it's somewhat risky. That your expected well-being is okay, but but in the Rawlsian picture, you'll be it'll be same native talent, same ambition. We both want to be a ballerina. Different prospects of competitive success. Therefore, this is going to register as a as a violation of Theo, and that that doesn't seem intuitive. To me. Whereas in other cases, suppose we've got same native talent, uh, and then. Uh, uh, we have uh, uh, different ambitions because some children, suppose that, uh, so, so in some cases, so, so, so as I said, some cases like the hippie parents versus the materialistic parents, it might seem okay, but in other cases, be, because the welfare prospects are okay, but in other cases, same native talent for two individuals, uh, uh, different ambitions because one is raised by fundamentalist parents. So they just, you just train the kid to be able to pray all day and so different prospects of competitive success. And there I want to say, no, 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 the child has a right to an open future. You know, you must educate the child so he has more prospects and more opportunities in life. And if I, and if I, but I, I don't, but if I think of what's lying behind my intuitions, it's that it's, it's, these are, you know, what are we, what, what are the welfare prospects, the well, the good life prospects for the child, the quality of life prospects for the child. Uh, the, the, um, so anyway, so there is the issue about, how to cope with the socialization issue, you know, ambition formation. Uh, so set that aside. Uh, it, it's, it's, uh, it, there's a literature that's, that worries about the fact that um, uh, uh, whether you become, uh, uh, your, your family, the legitimate liberty of parents can interfere with the achievement of fair quality of opportunity. So maybe we need some sort of trade-off here. I mean, in the Rawlsian framework, as you know, it's, there should be equal basic liberty for all. That's the first principle. And then equalities are okay, provided they meet two conditions. They are, they're attached to positions that are open to all under FIO, and they maximum. They, they make the primary goods possible because the worst off as well off as possible. So, you know, is, does parental liberty fit into the equal basis? Uh, it seems to me it doesn't matter. I mean, let parents have as much, do whatever they want to give their children a head start in life. If society is really committed to FIO, then it seems to me, in principle, you could have just the, the society, you know, think of head start to the max, individualized to the child. So whatever the parents do for the child, give the child a leg up, the egalitarian school system counterbalances that. If the wealthy parents send their kids to tennis camp, then the, na the, the poor kid uh, uh, also gets sent to, with, who's got tennis town, also gets sent to, to tennis camp. I mean, you, so you could, you could do this, and it seems to me you'd have to monitor parents for this, but it seems to me this, if this is really a big justice concern, then, then that should be okay. I mean, I don't, I don't say we should do this, it would be costly, the incentives for parents, would take away parents' incentives to invest, but it seems to me we, you could do this, so it isn't as though there really is the trade-off, but it raises the issue about the, the, uh, how important is uh, Theo compared to other values. And it seems to me, normally, often, fair quality of opportunity will ride along with a whole lot of other values. A lot of our values are going together. So many different theories of justice will say yes to it. But if we separate, find cases where Theo goes in one way and other justice values goes in, go in a different direction, then how, what, what What's the weight? And it's, it seems to me the answer, you know, I, I, I just don't see a weight there. I mean, so in, in other cases, in case, some cases, um, uh, what would be the, um, uh, suppose that we have a kind of affirmative action program for 
poor children, that is children with non-wealthy parents, uh, and uh, suppose we, get, we especially target the subset of poor children who have low native ability, right? So we, we pour in, it's a, a sort of affirmative action for the poor, untalented. So we pour in extra resources to these people so that feel will end up being violated then. Same native talent, same prospects of success, but, but these, these uh, poor, untalented kids uh, w you know, will, will have better prospects than, than uh, 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 in ways that violate feel. But it seems to me, all, all, you can think of lots of scenarios in which all things considered, that's fair. You know, the, uh, it's, 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 the, these people are still, don't have such great prospects for a great life. It's, 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 it's perfectly okay. Uh, it it does, shouldn't register as any kind of loss. There shouldn't be any kind of trade-off here. There's no moral loss, it doesn't seem to me, in these cases. Uh, and this would hold in the other direction. Suppose that we could bring about better achievement of, let's be ecumenical, egalitarian values by uh, putting extra educational resources into the high talented people, uh, the, the high talented children who are children of wealthy parents who are already going to have extra inputs from their wealthy parents, right? So, the, so we give extra resources to the high talented with the idea of they're going to later in life face a very egalitarian uh, uh, taxation policy, so they will be then be resources for a an egalitarian taxation policy, which will be providing uh, uh, resources for redistribution, which will be judiciously used to uh, advance the lives of the poor. I can imagine this working out in a way that your, your egalitarian social welfare function is maximized in this way, even though it's a violation of FIO. It seems to me that it just, it's, a, it's a don't count. Uh, these, these claims don't depend for their plausibility on the specific distributive justice view. It seems to me that it, it can be generic here. The arguments I've been making employ unrealistic hypotheticals. We don't, in fact, see hyper-egalitarian societies violating feel with the egalitarian aims and results described. I think this doesn't matter for purposes of making the argument. The hypotheticals are to help probe the question, what really matters, as opposed to being more or less reliably correlated with what really matters. Equal opportunity norms historically arose in the course of campaigns against feudal aristocratic privilege. The opposition was to reserving desirable social roles and occupations for those not already unfairly privileged. This impulse doesn't automatically oppose reserving desirable social roles and occupations for those who are already unfairly privileged, unprivileged, worse off than others. I mean, if it's counterproductive, you shouldn't do it, but then imagine situations in which it is productive and efficient from the standpoint of your own uh, egalitarian social welfare function. Uh, so we, it seems to me we should be relaxed and pragmatic in our attitudes towards equality of opportunity, whether formal or substantive. If affirmative action, refer, affer, reverse discrimination policies in education employment work out, imagine a society like Belgium or Northern Ireland or Israel or Palestine would benefit in ways that register in our egalitarian distributive justice norms by instituting a kind of consociational arrangement where the good jobs are reserved you know, for members, proportional members of the each ethnic group, right? So it's going to violate FIO, but, um, uh, but, 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 it, but it might be working out better in, in, in terms of other values. And then even if it's a permanent arrangement, it doesn't, it, I, I don't see it as bothering me. So you might not, so again, I just want to say, it's, it's, uh, uh, w w we want to uh, uh, consider uh, we, we, want, we just want to th think about, uh, invite, I just want to invite reflection. It, consider situations in which gains for FIO are not accompanied by goods that usually contingently ride with those gains, and then think about what, you're, what the trade-off is. I'm, I'm saying, when we carry out the exercise carefully, considering the most plausible candidate fundamental moral principles that exclude FIO, we'll see we, they don't need any FIO supplementation. But, you know, that, that's, that's, just, that's just a hunch. So I want to say a couple things, just a couple minutes, about uh, luck egalitarian equality of opportunity. Um, so I mean, in a nutshell, I mean, what's my position? Equality of opportunity. I'm not for equality. We should be maximizing something else. And I'm not for, you know, it's not opportunity provision. It's not opportunity provision that matters fundamentally. It's outcomes. Right, that, that, that's, so, so apart from that, I'm all for it.
Um, uh, so here's a, from, an, from an equity perspective, this is a quote from a uh, sociologist who's, uh, 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 from an equity perspective, children's life chances should depend less on the lottery of birth than on their own latent abilities, a sociologist observes, right? So they get uh, a, a common view. Excuse me, on its face, this is an odd claim. If anything is a sheer lottery beyond one's power to control, it's the process that determines one's latent abilities. These are already present at conception, in utero, before the individual has had any chance to make an effort to, or to do anything that might qualify as conferring extra dessert. If the moral imperative is that people's life chances shouldn't depend on sheer lotteries imposed on them beyond their power to control, then substantive equality of opportunity, maybe codified in some revised version of here, it looks to be an unstable compromise. You know, the, the, uh, 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 this is the nerve of, of, the, of the argument for the doctrine that's come to be known as luck egalitarianism, which is really a broad family of views. The rough idea is that people should enjoy the same level of benefit overall unless they come to be worse off than others in ways that lie within their power to control and hence are reasonably deemed to be their own responsibility. Uh, as Larry Temkin once observed, it's morally bad, unjust and unfair, if some are worse off than others through no fault or choice, fault or choice, this is actually two different views. You could think of fault as important, you could think of choice as important, you could think of a hybrid. Uh, it's morally bad if some, unjust and unfair, if some are worse off than others through no fault or choice of their own. Uh, the luck egalitarian doctrine takes equality of outcome to be the moral default, the position to which we should revert unless there's reason to shift from it. Uh, distinguishes between luck or chance that does or does not lie with the individual's power to control. Uh, so the first thing to say about this proposal is it's not really, you know, competitor or on all fours with these earlier formal equality of opportunity or for that matter libertarian opportunity or substantive equality of opportunity. It really is sort of changing the subject. The, the luck egalitarian principle is really purports to be you know, a, a doctrine of distributive justice. It tells us when inequalities are okay, whereas Theo in the Rawls system is, isn't designed for that role. Theo in Rawls system is just, if there are going to be inequalities, then a condition on justified inequalities is that they satisfy this Theo condition. But, but it does, that, that doesn't say whether there should be inequalities at all. So, so they're, they're, it's, it's really sort of changing the subject. Uh, again, it's a sort of simple, radical view. Uh, uh, everybody should be equally well off unless you've landed in this predicament through in some way that's really your own fault as when I make an avoidable bad choice uh, or comes about through choices through which you, for which you should bear responsibility as when I have an array of reasonably good outcomes from which to choose and select and I choose and select perhaps reasonably a risky option and then the risk goes sour. Uh, it faces the objection that the doctrine is both quiotic obviously and fetishistic it's quiotic. Uh, it's so far removed. It it's makes justice demand so far discordant with prevailing social reality, so far removed from any politically feasible changes we could implement. Uh, it doesn't have any relevance for real world practical guidance. And it's fetishistic in that luck egalitarianism on its face demands equal distribution, even when some unequal distribution would render all, us all better off, or some of us better off and none worse off. I think the objections are misplaced. On the quiotic, I mean, look, I mean, you, 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 the, the lucky Galtrain view might be a maximizing view, in which case uh, uh, it, it won't just say, you know, suppose, suppose we've, we're faced all sorts of constraints, and we're not going to get, you know, we're, we're, we're going to be very far from achieving this maximal equality of opportunity, uh, but as long as we've got, you know, a social ordering that ranks the states, uh, th then we'll be able to say, uh, even if things are really grim, you know, what we should do. Um, uh, it, that's, it's, it's, you know, it'll tell us what to, you know, what to do in a concentration camp. It'll tell us what to do. Uh, half a loaf is, you know, uh, better than none if we can't get it. One crumb is better than no crumb if we can't get half a loaf. You know, we'll, we'll, whatever the constraints are, we'll have practical advice to give. I, I mean, it wouldn't have to be a maximizing view. It's just to me, suppose your view is just equality of opportunity defined a certain way. Still, if you can provide some measure of approximations to equality, uh, you can say, 
you know, how close you are, then you can give practical guidance. Uh, if we're further away and we can, we, with our ways we can get closer, we can't get up here, but we can get here rather than here, then, then again, there will be practical. So it isn't just, you know, uh, specifying an idea, a misty ideal. Uh, fetishistic, um, well, it, it isn't true. I mean, I mean, luck egalitarianism has been proposed or cousins or views in the family have been proposed by some prominent political theorists including Ronald Dworkin, Jerry Cohen, Larry Temkin, Thomas Nagel, John Romer. Uh, but none of these actual advocates is guilty of fetishism in the way I described. That is, none of them says we should just produce equality, come what may, let the heavens fall. They're all in favor of, you know, uh, 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 whatever, whatever the equalisandum is, whatever the, we should be trying to make equal, they want as much of it as possible. Right? They, they want to be maximizing as well. As, and in some way or other, we should be trading off the two objectives. Right? So it's not equality come what may. You, you might think Jerry Cohen is different, but even there, I think, if you look into the, into the text, he, he's, he, he accepts that. Right? So the fetishism objection can be reformulated. You can say, look, equal distribution Everybody having the same, whatever your measure of the, of the same is, it just doesn't matter for its own sake. It's just not morally important. How well your, what, what your bundle is compared to mine, that's not of fundamental importance. Uh, a sufficiency doctrine, for instance, might say that. Uh, uh, but notice, so you might, in response to that objection, you might dig in your heels and say, no, no, no equality does matter. Maybe it's not the only thing that matters, but it does matter, equality of, of opportunity as now defined in this luck egalitarian way. I, I, just want, I just note that there's just a random view that I happen to agree with. Uh, there's a close cousin. You, you can accept the fetishism objection and accept that f equality of outcome doesn't matter for its own sake, uh, but there's a close cousin, namely uh, a, a prioritarian view as described which wants you know, more benefits for people, wants the benefits to be fairly distributed, and thinks of fair distribution as you know, putting a thumb on the scale for the worse off. You don't, we don't care about uh, how my situation compares with yours fundamentally, but we, but we care more about helping you if, if you're, uh, you're very badly off. So if we can get an ice cream cone pleasure to homeless Julie, who's always had a bad life, or to Bill Gates, who's had a great life, and Bill Gates would get more welfare from the ice cream because he's a great converter of resources into well-being than Julie. We, we tilt towards Julie because she's so bad. So, 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 we, so there's a close cousin of the lucky Galtrain that, that isn't vulnerable to the fetishism objection, if you think it's, a, if it's an objection. Um, so, not, uh, not, so uh, it's also the case, though, that not only does priority, deliver no endorsement of equality of outcome, it doesn't attach any intrinsic moral value to bringing it about that people have more rather than fewer opportunities, right? Um, I mean, in some situations, you know, there's a question of how you define opportunities. So in some situations, you know, more resources, fewer opportunities. But, 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 but even uh, but, you know, on, on the right view of how to, how to measure opportunities or resources, uh, Suppose we could bring it about that Arneson and people like him have greater opportunities for living well, and we can do this at moderate cost. Suppose the Arneson type people, hmm, this is not counterfactual, are now badly off, heading toward low quality lives unless something is done for them. We could bring it about that Arneson and peers come to have great opportunities to enjoy, let's say, life enhancing opera performances. We can subsidize local performances and put opera houses all over California. Uh, we can build free gyms that will give Arneson and others the opportunity to achieve some physical fitness and athletic achievement. Uh, so we, we can provide these opportunities for people uh, and this is a genuine opportunity for a better life. So my opportunity for well-being, rightly measured, goes up. Uh, and we can do this at very small cost or at reasonable cost. Uh, but this, but this, if opportunity provision matters for itself, it matters independently of whether you think the people will exercise the opportunities in any way that will be for their benefit. So suppose that's not true. I mean, the people like me hate opera, and, they, and they're not going to exercise no matter what. So the gyms and the opera houses are just going to stand. It seems to me, I mean, it doesn't have to be zero, but just for an extreme, just suppose there's zero chance, you know, 
the opportunities are being provided. They're genuinely making you, you know, giving you free, uh, real freedom. If, if you choose this option, you will get it. Genuine real freedom, but zero outcome improvement. Uh, then it seems to me the, uh, the any obligation to provide the opportunities disappears, right? You know, uh, so, so it's not, I mean, it's a hokey example, but the, the idea is that, again, opportunities and freedom. This is really, this goes back to Itai's talk yesterday, but it's the opposite. You see, you have the, uh, uh, the opposite intuition with, you know, if, if the freedoms just aren't going to register at all in the outcome assessment, they just don't register. You know, that, you know, and you've got, you've got the, unfortunately, uh, he's sitting right here. <laughs> if only I had an argument. You know, you've, you've got the opposite intuition. You know, that, uh, uh, um, uh, notice, though, that, I mean, again, to go back to yesterday's talk, I might be a pure instrumentalist with regard to freedom and not think it has intrinsic value. It's actually constitutive for getting some achievements, but forget that. Uh, but I think it's instrumental not to preference satisfaction or welfare as a near term, but to achieving objectively good lives, to, to achieving objective values, right? And so uh, I, just, I just flagged that just because just to, I didn't get my hand up in that, that, that session. Okay, so, so, um, um, so the, in, the rest of the, in the rest of the paper, I fuss about how to construe the luckism component in luck egalitarianism. You know, it's both, it's both egalitarian, which should bring about equal opportunities for people, understood a certain way, and it's luck, it's luckist. That is, there's some, luckism is roughly some personal responsibility element that enters into distributive justice at a fundamental level. And I actually think, I think that's controversial. Uh, I think 98% of our holding people responsible is really instrumental. But I think there's, there's, a, there's a real issue here, and I, ha I think that, that, that the luckism question, the question of what it's really fair to hold people responsible for, such that there can be a case where, where you know, ETI does better, I do worse, but because of personal responsibility, or the lack thereof, uh, uh, you know, this doesn't register as an injustice in our proper justice metric. You know, I, I think that's, I think, I think that's, that's a, a correct intuition, but it's really a work in progress. In the paper, I sort of mumble about different ways to think about luckism and their various problems. So I just think this is a project, but, 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 a, but a worthwhile one. Right, so, so equality, no, in luck egalitarianism, but luckism, yes. Uh, and, and, then I just, and then I just mentioned at the end of the paper that an issue. So these issues about you know, exactly what our egalitarian uh, welfare function, uh, wh what's the equalisandum, what exactly is it that's going to be maxim that's going to be maximized? What exactly is the maximizing function? Is it maximize? Is it equality? Maximize equality at the highest possible level of well-being or primary goods? Maximize or prioritize something else? Maximin? That, that really sort of, these are, and then luckism, what's the personal responsibility of you? These views are important, but they really com pale in comparison compared to uh, the scope issue. Right? I mean, luck, as described, luck egalitarianism is completely global in scope. I mean, we stand to conceive of distributive justice principles as operating country by country. Mexicans have egalitarian distributive justice obligations to Mexicans, Canadians to Canadians, Nigerians to Nigerians, and so on. But there's nothing, I think, in the luck egalitarian Fam, family of distributive justice principles, at least as I've described it, others disagree, uh, that suggests the appropriateness of any such scope restriction. And so I think this, you know, that this extending your scope in that way is just way more important for practical policy purposes than, than the stuff I've been worried about. So I'll stop there. <laughs>
some direct experience with a debate like this when I visited uh, Korea, so uh, Seoul, a few years ago. Uh, they were worried about the fact that rich families are giving their high school students outside tutoring. Uh, and the question was, should, should uh, schools provide tutoring for kids who didn't have rich parents? They decided they didn't have enough resources to do that, and so it, in, instead they, they banned rich parents from outside tutoring uh, to get an egalitarian <coughs> uh, How How would you analyze that policy? Well, I mean, what I, that, again, that's, that's the sort of issue that, that comes up. In, 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 there's a long debate, you know, Susan Oaken and others, uh, you know, parental liberty, uh, Jim Fiskin and many, you know, parental liberty, reasonably understood that the liberty of parents to raise their children as they see fit conflicts with uh, 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 substantive equality of opportunity in the Rawlsian sense. So that we've got it, what, what do we do? So, uh, so you're suggesting it, it, may be, it may be inefficient. You know, the thing that I'm suggesting, you know, let the parents do whatever they want and you offset, that may be inordinately costly. So maybe you could just, you could ban parental liberty more easily. Uh, that, that, that's not, that, that's, that's a possibility. If you valued field, you, that, you, that might be the, the right thing to do. Um, all I was saying was that you, without, you don't have to, the, the ability, the, the, the ability of society, society isn't constrained by parental actions to give their kids a boost up, provided you're willing to do whatever it takes to offset that. That's all I was saying. So I, I'm not, you know, as to what would be wrong to, via, to ban parental liberty here, I, I don't, I, I haven't taken a stand on it. Uh, I mean, I think probably not, but since I don't think of FIO as fundamental, I'll, I'll want to look at it in a different way. All right, so we'll come here to you uh, Yeah, so I have uh, two comments. The first is about the idea of equality of outcomes in roles and other theories. I, I think that you could say that roles is also for equality of outcomes, but what? Theory is different is the unless clause. So it's equality of outcomes unless. And the logic I don't say unless you're responsible for it. And rules, I say simplify it, unless uh, it decreases welfare. You, you could you could argue. And I, I say that for economists the the second it sounds like a Economize. Yes, <laughs> that's what I'm saying. I'm, I'm <laughs> maybe, maybe that's okay. Maybe that's okay. Uh, but I think that the, the, the view that it's unless you're responsible it is, as you just exposed, a, a very intractable view because it's so hard to s conceptualize what it means to be responsible, and then this could change people's incentives and so on. And at least from from an economist point of view, saying unless it decreases <laughs> welfare, and you have to define then what welfare is seems potentially more uh, uh, tractable, because then we can start thinking about how incentives will play out and so on. So you know that, that's just uh, a, a comment. So that's, that's one. And the other thing I wanted to- Can I just cut in just quickly? Just, just, just on that, and then, then you can start. So, so I mean, um, um, the, uh, um, I mean, I, I, I think of, uh, responsibility as Kantian goodwill, so of course it's not measurable. But then it's an then it's an and, and it, but then it's an open question. Does it does it matter? Well, I mean it's an open policy. Could you get some kind of proxy for it? I mean yesterday someone was suggesting a distinction between you know wealth that just falls on you by inheritance versus wealth that you earn and distinguishing that. Well, that's our very rough sort of proxy. But who knows? You know you, you might so so the, the the idea would be. If, if you thought it mattered, the idea would be to find reasonable proxies for it, and are the proxies good enough? Right? So one question is, do you care about it? And another, and, I mean, and, and another thing is, is uh, uh, can you get any kind of policy handle on it? And I, I'm open on both questions. I mean, roughly, I think it matters up to hard determinism, but I'm probably a hard determinist. So, uh, okay, so the second point just quickly was about the equality of opportunity policies. So I, I thought one interesting example to bring up is India. So in India, there's this article by Beeman and, and co-authors looking at 
uh, women and reserve seats. So in some Indian villages, they reserve the seat of the head of village on a rotating basis to women or lower caste individuals. And what's very interesting with, so that's one of the affirmative action policies mm -hmm. you could take. What's very interesting with that is that afterwards, as more women, because of these forced policies, were accessing those positions, when the elections became free and open without these restrictions, a lot more women were running and were being elected. So I think that's an interesting example of how a constraining policy to you know, improve some form of equality of opportunity changes the whole field even once you, you take it away. So that, that's just, I thought, an interesting example. Yeah, no, I think, I think, but I think in that kind of case, I think a wide variety of justice views will converge on saying, as you described, this sounds like a good idea. So this isn't going to be a test case, I think. Um, I, 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 I think, for instance, uh, unequal taxation of men and women. Suppose we tax women's earnings at a lower, at a lower level than men's because men's are, men are more you know, tied to, the, to hanging on to the job or something like that. Yeah, I mean, I, I have no, I have, I have no, that kind of tagging sounds fine to me. I mean, if, again, if it, I want to see how it works, that's all. So we're going to go back to the back of the room and then show a few more of you. Oh, all right. Um, thanks. Uh, so I also have two, uh, two very brief things to ask um, Professor Arneson, and both have something to do with Rawls in the background. So it seemed like um, the first argument you gave against the Rawlsian understanding of fair quality of opportunity was you said, something like, well, it doesn't take into account um, ambition formation, right? And the way that um, and the kinds of ambitions that you would have uh, are um, socially generated and can be vastly unequal. I'm just wondering if a Rawlsian wouldn't say something like, well, it's just an indirect effect of implementing fair equality of opportunity over time um, and actually being a principle that guides our institutions. It's just going to be an indirect effect over time that people's uh, <coughs> capacities for ambition formation will be equalized too, right? So um, it's something like fair equality of opportunity has this instrumental, I mean, this intrinsic value. Once you implement it over time, you see that it starts to pr produce these things that we value as well, such as equality, um, um, greater equality in ambition formation. So that's the first brief thing. The second. Can I stop? Just I, yeah. Alzheimer, early Alzheimer's. I just want, at most one at a time. Probably, probably, probably not. I probably can't even. So yeah, about that. that that's one possible. That's one possible way the world might go. That would be nice. But the world might go a different way. So I want my justice theory to be to be adequately responding to not just the actual world, but at least the close possible worlds, and actually to quite distant possible worlds. So yes, you know, you know, if that, if that. If that happens and the history unrolls like that, then again, a variety of views will be giving the same outcome. So that's not a good test case for what, which theory of justice should we give allegiance to. Okay. And the uh, second brief thing I wanted to ask, again, um, picking up on the kinds of things Rawls sometimes says, so your final comments about um, if equality is, is, is intrinsically valuable, I'm curious just what you would make of the kind of argument that says something like economic equality matters because it r r leads to r relations of respect between ci citizens. So it's so it's 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 an economic value but it matters for political relations, which is a kind of argument that Small sometimes gives when he talks about the value of self-respect. And I'm just curious what your take on that kind of view. It's a very important view. It's a competitor view. And the idea is roughly that the equality that we care about is not equality of economic outcome for its own sake. We really care about, and we have to cash this out, but some notion of equal social relations or equal respect among citizens or something in that vein. And that, that's a very important view. You, we have to, it's, it's a project. We need to work it out. My own, my own I mean, Sam Scheffler, who advocates the view, says, well, look, uh, inequality, so in, the idea is inequalities in rank, status, and power are, sort of, are bad. But 
Scheffler says, well, they're, they're ubiquitous. Which ones matter? You know, so we, you, you might give a criterion for which ones matter. But again, you can imagine how I'm going to respond. I'm going to turn this around. I'm going to say these relations of social relations of equality matter insofar as they help us achieve good lives for people fairly distributed. You know, but, but if, you know, you know, to the extent, you know, that's, that's, that's not the case, you know, my wife's insulting me is the only way to keep me on the straight and narrow, then, then you know, then, 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 then that's okay. So, so, the, so the, the, again, these, the, that doesn't mean democratic is, again, unimportant. It can be of the utmost importance. And social relations, and, you know, and, you know, uh, equal, you know uh, uh, the, something in the culture, and a culture of equal social status or something. So when you, when you bump up against somebody in the subway, you don't have to make, you know, bow your hat as though to the nobles. I mean, I, I, that can be of utmost importance. But, I, but again, I think, I think ultimately it's going to be of derivative importance, except insofar as certain, you know, in, in capability of certain functionings require equality for the function and you know, for the objectively valuable achievement. And where that's true, then the, then the, then the, the equal social relation will enter directly in. Uh, sorry, that's, that, that's the general line. But, but again, that's just a big, important topic. And there's nothing I've said should convince you that that whole view is the right way to go rather than anything I've said. So that, that's just a big, important issue. All right, so we're going to. Can I just say about Tim? That I, I just think, independently of what exactly the right way to capture in a, a, what, uh, the normative view, I just think thinking carefully about how to think about equal opportunity in a, you know, as it would operate over generations with the different ways in which parents can influence children at different say, I, I think that's the modeling that just seems beautiful and, and, and wonderful. And you, know, and, you can, and you can take different normative, you can do it in different independently of exactly which norms you use. I was going to ask, actually, it's sort of, I think it does link, in a sense, these two papers. And it builds a little bit on what Eric was asking about, which is, is there any sense? So I mean, Tim's paper was very worried about how we treat the different things about parents, right? Their natural endowments, their efforts, their investments, things like that. And I guess I wondered, say all you cared about was equality of opportunity, fair equality of opportunity. Is there some sense in which the parents' choices are part of making sure that the parents have equality of opportunity for what they think of as a good life for themselves, or as what their well-being is about. And so by offsetting some of the choices that the parents make, say for tennis lessons or whatever, either with high taxation or with banning tennis lessons, to guarantee the equality of opportunity for the child, are you not just violating parental liberty, which is, I, I take it, an interesting point, but maybe violating the equality of opportunity for the parents themselves? Is there some contradiction there or not? Or are we not worried about that part of equality of opportunity for the parents? I, I think, oper I think you know, parenting is a you know is, can be a great um, a, a achievement when it works, uh, and <laughs> and 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 you know, and a great source of fulfillment on, by various <laughs> metrics. Uh, and, but and, and so you know, safeguarding that for people is important. You know, and the, the you know, uh, but I mean, I th but again, I don't have. My, my, what I can legitimately do for my, and, and I, I don't want just the child to prosper, I want the child to prosper by my agency, right? So that's an important freedom or opportunity. But I mean, but I, but I mean again, I, I, could, I could help the child prosper by ensuring he has high status in a caste society and, you know, the, and gets above the lower caste, you know, or, you know, or, our, or that our caste has upward social mobility, so our caste rises and your caste falls, and that's not okay if it's, you know. And so if you think that, fair quality of opportunity is a requirement of justice, then the opportunity for parents to do that will not count as legitimate in the same, you know, in the more unproblem, just as in the more unproblematic caste way. That, that, that would be, I think, the Rawlsian response. Yeah, I just wanted to register a worry about um, whether the... Only one. Yeah, only, only one, one big one, which is just about whether or not the, the particular arguments you make against each of these views support the conclusion that you want to draw, which is that these are not components of fundamental justice, right? Because, and the, the worry is this, is that um, something can be a component of fundamental justice, while it nevertheless be the case that justice overall requires that it be overridden in particular cases, right? So the, the case about the libertarian form of equality of opportunity, I think you've shown that obviously this is not sort of 
um, always overriding that we could restrict this this type of uh, quality of opportunity when much is at stake for an agent in this sort of uh, easy rescue type of case. Um, in the careers open to talents, I think there are certainly cases where you can show that careers open to talents should be overridden because the objectives of justice overall are better achieved if you override it similarly with the Rawlsian uh, FEO, right? So, so I guess the question is, um, have these arguments shown that these are not components? I mean, I'm not really committed one way or the other to any of the particular ones. Have they shown that these are not components, or have they just simply shown that, you know, they certainly don't have, they don't always override or don't always have absolute weight, right? Because all of these cases struck me that, you know, people might think that, well, if you could get uh, the same um, outcomes without violating formal equality of opportunity, say by having background institutions which offset in the ways that sort of Eric might have been suggesting, um, uh, these these types of inequalities that would arise by parental by differential parental ability to affect their children that would be better than having this situation where we give this different weighting to the applications of children coming from one background or another. Anyways, no, that's that's good. I don't claim to have defeated that. I, I'm not sure I can fully defeat. I mean, I I invite you to think about examples where the justice the alleged justice values pull in different ways or it's neutral and only fair quality of opportunity is rising and see how much you care about it. And then having described in some sort of stylized way a couple of simplified examples, we, you know, I, I, my response is that, that uh, we, it really has no weight right here. But of course, that's the, uh, uh, the claim would be, no, 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 the most you've shown, I mean, Rawls gives this, this lexi lexical priority. Maybe it shouldn't have lexical priority, but it's still very important. Well, maybe it's not very important, maybe it's somewhat important, and the weaker you make it, the, the less I can claim to have made even a plausibility argument. I mean, what I want to say about, I mean, about libertarian self-ownership is that it's a procedure that helps make the world better for people. If it really worked out, suppose the social science, I mean, I don't believe this, but suppose the social science of the 23rd century says we get much better, you know, better lives for people, fairly distributed, if everybody has self-ownership over his neighbor. You know, you know, I have full self-ownership rights over Glenn, and Glenn has full self rights over Itai, and that just works out better. Uh, you know, I mean, the, 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 you know, my, my, your selfishness is, you know, you know, whatever the story is, yeah, you know, so don't care. Self-ownership is, is, you know. Anyway. I just wanted to ask something what uh, you were saying earlier. I thought you meant that is there like any sense that there's a lack of equal opportunity for the parents for their own life, right? Not, not from what they're going to derive from their, from their children, right? In the sense yeah. that maybe, yes. I, maybe yes. just luckily I had a like, really extremely talented child and maybe somehow that makes my old age prospects so much better, right? But do you want to somehow compensate that away? <laughs> well, I mean, is that? yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, on my view, I mean, uh, insofar as there's, you know, genuine good that's coming here to the parent, that matters. And if, it, if, it, if it's important enough and to take it away would result in too much cost to other values, uh, I'm, I'm, I would, I would, you know, I, I mean, look, a prioritarian view can sometimes, can sometimes require upward transfer, you know, where Bill Gates gets so much pleasure out of the next yacht that we tax the homeless Julie to, I mean, that, that you know, uh, you know d depends on how the numbers work out, right? So I, so I don't rule out the parental opportunity to, you know, to improve the life of your child. Anyway, I, I don't rule that out as weightless. Go ahead. Um, so, Tim, one question I had, and I don't know if you've looked at this, is it seems to me a perennial question is whether the standard measures of intergenerational mobility have anything at all to do with equality of opportunity, or whether they're just completely orthogonal to it. Uh, so that's something I'd be really interested in looking at in your model. So like, imagine you move around the parameter space of your model. How often is it the case that, say, the measures that Nathan and uh, Raj and company use uh, track or do not track your measures of equality of opportunity derived from the literature, or IG like tracks or does not track across parameter values. In the sense that 
like how persistent would these values be? No, no, I mean when is you change like the, the parameter values, yeah. how frequently is it the case that together goes up your measures of quality of opportunity and Nathan and slash IG? And how often is it the case that, that they actually move in opposite directions as you change the parameter yeah, values? Or under what that. sets of parameter changes they track or do not track? Because I, I, to me that's like a fascinating question because, you know, there's this whole framing of IG and the Nathan stuff as having something to do with the quality of opportunity. But you can think of obvious reasons why it might not have anything to do with the quality of opportunity. I mean, IG could be high just because everyone is randomly being assigned you know, various things. Can, can I just ask, you know. what's, is social mobility here if I'm in the lowest decile of the income, if my parents are in the lowest decile of the income population, what are the chances that I will I would like to answer that question. Yeah, so that's one way to measure it. Yeah. The, the uh, common way you do it, we do it is look at, take a fixed parent income rank, look at the average rank of the kids and look at income distribution. And then that slope turns out to be really linear, so you can parameterize those relationships very parsimoniously, and you can characterize places basically by the degree of the difference between kids at the bottom versus the top of the income distribution. Uh, that's the, the, the simplest way to, to, to... Yeah, but you can imagine all sorts of things that would have nothing to do with the quality of opportunity that could move that around. And, and the question is... Yeah, so I guess, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I didn't, I didn't try, like, the entire parameter space, obviously, but... Um, so as far as I've been playing around, I'm, you know, I'm trying to dip, dip, like assimilate the model to different policies, specifically not so much the parameters, right? But basically what happens is that you, you could, I can change the degree of the persistence a lot by just pl playing with the parameters, right? But then the, what I call the equality of, uh, my measure of equality of opportunity in the paper, this is kind of more or less flat for, for a pretty wide region, unless you, unless you like uh, kind of really target just the very poor and make it like super progressive, and then the mobility is going to shoot up, but and that's going to also manifest in um, like higher measures of equality of opportunity. But it has to be like really, really high. So in other words, you're saying most of what ends up moving around, IG doesn't move around. Yeah. You. Well, at least for what I've. Yeah. So yeah. So in crude non-economist terms, is this is right that you could, if you had a meritocratic society operating for five thousand years or something, and so, and so in this uh, dystopia of the future, s genetic ability varied with social class. You could have a society which was a satisfying, fair quality of opportunity in the Rawlsian sense, even though there was very little social mobility. Zero. Zero, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if there's no other questions, I'll go ahead and ask maybe the last one. So it kind of comes into the, the question of uh, uh, fairly distributed. So um, one thing that, that we've noted, if you look across areas in the US, areas that have more upward uh, social mobility tend to have less parental income inequality. So areas that have a lot less, uh, kind of more equally, fairly distributed resources in the parent generation tend to have uh, more upward mobility. I'll talk about whether or not that's a quality opportunity or not. When you look then at the kid distributions of income, you actually see areas that have more upward mobility actually have a more unequal distribution of outcomes in the kid income distribution. And uh, you know, there's a lot of reasons that, that could be uh, going on, but I'm wondering to what extent that throws sort of a wrench in how we think about um, fairly distributed in relation to mobility. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good question. Uh, can, I, can I actually ask, kind of yeah. ask a counter question before? Because I, <laughs> I thought when you look at the cross-country data, right, it was kind of the opposite of what you're saying, right? Uh, when you measure the parents' income, so it really seems to be a driver there is the, the parental income distribution, yeah. So more unequal parental income distributions tend to have uh, much lower rates of upward mobility. But then when you go track kids, say, and they take it, so we've only done it, haven't done this carefully across the U, uh, across countries, but within the U.S., areas that are more uh, upwardly mobile actually have higher 90-10 ratios, 50-90 ratios, and the kid income distributions. So, so for me, this is going to be we're talking about two things that, or three things that might move in different directions, and for me, they're all things that at most will be indicators. And what I really want to know is how do they affect something else that I really care about? So, for instance, it could be that the, uh, there's a world in which social mobility is very high. And Rawlsian fair quality of opportunity isn't uh, fulfilled, but but the social mobility is extremely important for getting in my standard. You know, we're not. I I don't, I don't want to be. You know, just sectarian. I think a broad array of 
egalitarian social welfare functions might like that better, right? So it de depends on what you're ultimately for, right? All right, so any other questions? Okay, so we'll take a break and I think we come back to